Lord, that uh, oh, there's no other place we'd rather be than in your presence. And, and God, as we come together this evening to just yeah, hear what you have to say, God. Lord Jesus, we, we, we praise you, we magnify your name. We say, let us, let us be yeah, the mirrors that... I remember this, this month started out with that sermon. Let us just be the mirrors that reflect you perfectly to the world. Uh, and this evening, Lord, I pray that oh, as we're getting ready to hear from you, Lord, that every word will be yours and yours alone. And nothing from me, God. And uh, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are the reason we are here. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> oh my goodness, um, it's a pleasure to be in front of you again. Uh, <laughs> um, I can't remember the last time I was here, but every time, every time I come up here, it almost feels like I need to learn how to do it again. So uh, it's always a privilege, uh, and it's it's really fun um, to to study, do some study with the Lord, and to be able to share with you what I think the Lord is wanting to say to us. Now, I um I want to begin by just a few encouragements that have nothing to do with the sermon. Um, I was speaking to a friend over the weekend and I had shared some stuff that's happening with the family and just the things that we're doing and we're trusting the Lord. Um, I, as an actor, I, as a, you know, my work is you, you go from one audition to the other, you do a hundred, maybe you get one and you just keep going. Um, but it still doesn't mean that, you know, you've got finances for the next day because you've got to figure it out somehow. So our faith journey with the Lord is, is amazing. And, um, and God is so faithful in it. But the friend of mine that I was talking to, um, I was saying to him, oh man, there's some auditions that I've had to say no to and things that I've not been able to do and this. Or this. And, he, and he just replied, this is now the age of WhatsApp and the voice notes, right? So you can feel like you're in a conversation, but you're actually just, there's a voice recording that's being sent back to you. And he, and he said to me something so beautiful that I, that I just, I, I believe it is for not just me. I could be selfish and keep it for myself, but I'm going to share it with you because I don't think it's just for me. But he said, look, all of those no's are building up to the time when there's a yes. And when God says there's a yes, there's an important time for that. So I, want, I don't know if that's for someone. Maybe for Malisha and Malcolm, you guys with your waiting, you know. Um, but, but I just want to encourage you, like, all the no's that you experience in the world, all of the things that are coming up against you, you know, the time when God says yes, God says yes, man. And there's nothing you can, nothing anyone can do to prevent that yes. You know, I believe that for this church. Um, this whole month has been us gearing up to just be able to get into our discipleship um, culture and you know, training each other up and trusting the Lord for breakthrough in this community. And I believe that when God says yes, it's going to be raining. It's going to be just living water. People are going to come in and it's going to be amazing. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And the second thing is from the same friend. So this friend is an amazing guy. I want to, I want to encourage you, if you don't have a buddy like this in your life, you've got to get yourself a buddy like this in your life. We speaks just even though he's 10,000 kilometers away, but just speaks directly into your um, um, situation. And he's, he was talking about just the, the struggles and the... Um, the challenges that I find myself going through in, in my life, you know, being a, being a family of five is no small feat. It's great fun, but it's hard. And, and he said to me, you know what? The Lord is also stretching you like an elastic band. And when he's, you know, you got to just, it's tight, you know, it gets tension. The tension's there. This is for someone else here tonight. All right. I told you I'm not going to be selfish. I'm going to share this stuff with you as well. He's pulling back he's pulling back he's pulling back and when he lets go nothing can stop that catapulting as well when he lets go he lets go for a reason and there's a specific time for it this is for someone who might be waiting right so there's a time situation that you might want to push um, up against for the Lord to hurry it up but he can't pull and he can't if, he, if the elastic band is not taut enough you're not going to go anywhere right I believe it for this church we, we have been pulled and we're still being pulled 
We're still being pulled quite a bit. And when it comes to the end of his pulling, when the Lord says, okay, this is enough, and he lets go, oh man, we're going over mountains, over valleys, over hills, all of that stuff. We're not even, you know, we sing about, you know, getting over these mountain tops, but the Lord is going to really catapult us over that stuff. And that's going to be the grace of God, and we'll know it's God only. All right, so those are the words that I wanted to share with you, um, courtesy of a very dear brother who has been, I've been walking this journey. We both uh, got saved around about the same year uh, when we were at Varsity together. And, and, and I really want to encourage you, if there are those relationships in your lives of people who have just walked roads with you, um, lean on them um, because their words are they, are, they know you more than anyone else, I'm sure. Because the Varsity days, we all know. University, we all have scary stories to share with one another. Um, so please, yeah, I want to encourage you. Strengthen each other um, with those in your lives who care about you and who know your story. So tonight, I want to just make a, a confession right at the beginning to say that t- today's sermon is not necessarily, I guess, how I would usually prepare a sermon. In the, f- in the sense that tonight I wanted to just take time to do a bit more, I guess, teaching. I don't know if I'm a teacher naturally as a gifting. I do enjoy teaching. So I'd want to do a couple of teaching bits. So there's the things that I want to just start out with in terms of the discipleship time that we are preparing for. I feel it is also an important thing that I can share with you guys before we get to Wednesday night's training, before we get to Friday night's um, prayer and worship, and then the weekend of outreach. And that is basically just building on what we've had all over this month and just the expectations of a disciple. That's just basically what I want to share with you today. I've pulled from very many sources, Bible School 1, um, my study Bibles, all of the things that I can find in my house that are at my disposal. And, and, and I found that for myself, you know, on my journey to being discipled, on my journey to also wanting to disciple others, I actually was struggling to figure out, oh, actually just what's expected of me as someone who is a disciple. I want to um, ask you a question. It's not rhetorical. Who in here knows that they're a disciple? Yes, keep going, keep going. Hands up, hands up, hands up. Yeah, cool. We're all disciples, and I'm going to tell you why we're all disciples. When you were born again, and you gave your life to Jesus, that was the automatic sort of, here you are, discipleship stamp. You were a disciple of Jesus. Because a disciple is basically someone who goes on a journey with a teacher, um, someone who's a, uh, their, their leader or, or discipler, and they go on that journey with them and learn from them and want to draw from them and they want to emulate them and imitate them and basically that's it, right? So we all know in our journey when we started out and Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 4 and he said to them, you know, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He was basically saying to them, okay, cool, you're going to leave this stuff behind, you're going to follow me, and I'm going to show you how to do this thing. So when you said yes to Jesus, which is a good thing that you said yes to Jesus, is the best thing that you ever did for yourself in your life. Can we just stop there for a second? It's the best thing you ever did for yourself in your life, saying yes to Jesus. All right, I want to remind you, when you're looking at the car, you're looking at the house, you're looking at the job, the promotion, you're looking at anything else, the, the, the possible partner, love, love interest, uh, career prospects, whatever it is, a uh, bigger family, whatever it is, the best thing that ever happened to you in your life was the day you said, Jesus, I surrender all, I'm leaving it all behind, and I want to follow you, okay? On that day, Matthew 4 All the way through Matthew, there are beautiful examples of what it means to be called and commissioned at the same time. So the the story of discipleship, and I want to make sure that today, as we're going through the, 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 the evening sermon, you understand that there's no confusion anymore. All right, And for you folks listening as well, there's no confusion as to who is a disciple of God, of Jesus. Who is a disciple? All of us. That's the answer. If you follow Jesus, you're a disciple of Jesus. Okay? Call and commission happens at the same time. So if you and I 
immediately when we say yes to Christ are now disciples of Christ what do you what do we know how do we know the things that are expected of us now the best place to start and this is why I think this month has been really cool for me is because I was like you know what I'm gonna tr- just read the book of Matthew as, as best I can I got to about chapter 10 of the book of Matthew the reason being why I got to the chapter 10 is because the whole book first of all I stopped at the Sermon on the Mount because the Sermon on the Mount is the exact it's like a blueprint of what a disciple should be I want to encourage you now go and read the Sermon on the Mount blessed are the poor you don't believe me let me let me open it up for you Matthew 5 yeah so if you have your Bibles please follow with me don't worry I'm not going to read all three chapters but if you know your Bible you know that the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 all the way through Matthew 7 Jesus spends a whole lot of time just preaching just sharing just telling the crowds and his disciples after he has chosen his 12 right because he said to them come follow me and as he was going he was picking up more guys more guys more guys and at the end of it there were 12 of 12 of them he goes up onto a mountain and he starts to it says the Bible says he opens his mouth how amazing is that so Matthew 5 begins this way this is verse 2 and he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they shall they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth right and you read the Beatitudes all the way through I'm gonna skip Matthew uh, 513 says you are the salt of the earth but if salt has lost its taste how shall its saltiness be restored Um, and then later on he says you are the light of the world the city on a hill cannot be hidden then he goes on and he talks about um, he's he's come to fulfill the law he talks about anger you know you must not have anger in your heart you mustn't lust in your heart he talks about loving your enemy he talks about divorce he talks about oaths let your yes be yes and your no be no he talks about almost everything you might want to put together as a Christian's walk and what you need to observe as in a Christian life in your life if you're confused about where you need to go as a disciple and what you need to do as a Christian just start with the Sermon on the Mount once you finish studying the Sermon on the Mount read the rest of Matthew because I'm going to show you something in the book of Matthew that is beautiful every instance that Jesus has with his disciples is about discipleship every instance every instance is about call and commission every time it's almost as though Jesus couldn't help himself but use every opportunity and he was like you guys are are still thinking here at step one I'm gonna use every opportunity at step one to remind you of step one and step one is to basically take up your cross and follow me if you read Matthew, read Matthew and you see all the different ways that Jesus is basically saying, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So let's go to Matthew 16 together. So Matthew 16, verse 24. Now this is the basis of all things when you want to look at discipleship. Matthew 16, verse 24 deals with the four D's of discipleship. It reads as follows. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I'll read it again. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The four D's, real quick. Desire. To be a disciple of Christ, you need to have desire for Jesus. You need to desire to be with the Lord constantly all the time you need to want to be with the Lord you need to want to love the Lord you need to want it you can't call yourself a Christian and not be engaged with the one who the name Christian is after Christ Ian little Christ's you can't do that that's not how it works and and in a sense the world of Christianity that we live in right now is somewhat like that I can choose how I'm going to be a Christian and do my own thing and that's not the way it is do you know why do you know why I use the word choose the word choose has got a lot of correlation with the way in which we do life in the world and the way in which we do life in the world means we go about it as consumers 
We choose what we want, when we want, and how we want it. And Christ says, no, 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 that's, that's a misunderstanding of what this um, family is all about. You don't choose what you want. If you want to be with me, and nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Christ is like, you should want to be with me because the other part of it is not fun. Then you don't have the space to choose how you be with him. Does that make sense? None of us have the freedom and the liberty to choose how we are with Christ. Because he's already laid out how you should be with him. He's already laid out how you should follow him. He's already said how you should be. And that is, firstly, Matthew 16, 24. Okay, you need to desire. You need to, I I want you. I'm not holding back on being with you. I want you. So I desire to be with you. You should desire to be with me too. Any Christian or any, any person who says they believe in Jesus, but isn't necessarily engaging with the king, there's issue there. And that is enough, um, uh, uh, not authority, yes authority, there's enough authority in your life if you're walking a road with them to speak to that thing, because there's issue. And I'm going to touch on authority later on as well. Second thing that Jesus says, immediately after desiring, Jesus says, okay, then you've got to deny yourself. Second D. First one is desire Jesus. Second one is deny yourself. I want you to see there's a beautiful correlation of what is going on already with what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus desired the Father more than he desired himself. Jesus denied himself more than he tried to save himself. Do you understand? Do you understand now there's already like, when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, he means, look, there's an actual pattern. I'm not imitating someone who didn't put down the example. Jesus put the example there and he's not saying to you to do something that he's not willing to do either. And that's just the bottom line. So he says to deny yourself. Now, denying yourself is another thing in this, in this culture and in this day and age that we also don't understand. We don't understand. And I, I'm, I'm speaking to myself as I'm speaking to you. I, I'm honestly being honest with you because th- this, this kind of stuff is the things that I wrestle with all the time. When I said to you earlier, I'm a fa- family of five. I mean, I like driving. I want a car. Are my prayers about a car? No, not anymore. When did Jesus help me figure out that my prayers shouldn't be just about a car? Just the other day. <laughs> I'm being honest to you. I'm sprinkling it with a bit of fun here. But the truth is the truth. You know? Our prayer life does say a lot about how we engage with Jesus. So how you pray will tell you whether or not you are actually um, at that place where you deny yourself. How you pray will be a beautiful litmus test as to how much of your denial of yourself you're actually doing. Third one, take up his cross. He says, and take up his cross. So the daily taking up of your cross is number three. Deny, desire, deny, daily crucifixion. Daily crucifixion. Do you know why daily crucifixion is important? It's because this thing called the mind, which is beautiful because Romans 12 two, um, says we must be, transformed by by our minds right we must move into a place where there's a renewal not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our minds and the thing that is the mind and the thing that is the flesh those two things alone make it incredibly difficult to go one day to go one day not thinking about yourself so it means Every day, every day, you must be diligent, diligent to say, Lord, where's my cross? I want to ask you, are your prayers like that lately? I'm just trying to lay out an, ex- an expectation of what a, discipleship, a disciple should be. So every day, I need to be praying, Jesus, show me what my cross is, so that I can take it up and follow you. Do you know why you must take up the cross? For the same reason why Jesus took up the cross. 
Not that you are Jesus and you're going to die and um, um, atone people of sins, but for the eternal glory that awaited him because of it. The other stuff, only Jesus can do. But in the same way that if you and I take up our crosses daily, man, there's that eternal glory that is awaiting us. And do you know that in, in heaven there's going to be a separation between those who took up their crosses and followed him and those who kind of just... Ah. And that glory is going to be different. You're going to be at the back of the room. And in heaven it's not cool to be at the back of the room. I know in high school it was cool. In high school it was very cool. Just in the back of the room, the teacher doesn't see you, you can do whatever you want. In heaven it's not going to be, it's not going to be, there. It's not going to be cool. You'll be in heaven, you'll be, you'll be there. But it'll be, hey, you want to be close with the Father. We want to be close. We want to be counted. We want to be among those that are counted as, these are my faithful servants. These are my sons and daughters. These are the ones who, when I said to them, don't do this, and they said to me, but Lord, the paycheck is here. I can do this TV series because there's a paycheck here. And he says, no, don't do it because of this thing in the TV series. And he goes, okay, I'm not going to do it. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to be in the front of the room. But I'm saying that's my daily test. To look at the bank balance, to look at the things that are happening in, the li in my life and my family's life, and to look at the things that God is challenging me with. And He's saying, I want you to do this for me. I testified a long time ago when I, was, when I left the show, there was a very popular show in, in the world right now. And, 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 and God challenged me and He said, look, dude, um, we need to have a serious conversation now. His grace was amazing during the time that I was with this show. And he simply said to me, I want to make a shift in your life. Is your work for your fame or is it for my name? Which one is it? Are you wanting to make yourself famous or are you wanting to be here for me? My name and my name alone. And I had to make a serious, I had to serious numbers with, with my wife. But we were both assured of the one thing that I shared with you already. That when you said yes to Jesus, you made the best decision in your life. And I tell you, when those hard times come, you need to be able to have desired Jesus, to have been in the habit of denying yourself, so that when the daily, daily things come and the temptation is heavy, you know that there's already a testimony, a trail that you've left behind, that Jesus has already laid out for you. There's a trail, almost like breadcrumbs, that lead you back to the Father. You know, the, the problem with, with us as Christians in this modern era is that we're not disciplined enough. And you know what discipline does? Discipline allows you to be able to stick to something even when it's hard. That's just simply what discipline is. People who train a lot, people who exercise or who run or who, people who go that 10th that kilometer or that 10th mile and they're running a race and someone else is like, I just can't make it. The only reason why the other person is going further is because they're disciplined. It's because they know, okay, the pain is the pain. It's not going to change at mile 20. It's not, it, there might be a second wind and that's beautiful, but the, 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 the structure of this, this experience is set up this way. And the reason why I can make it through is because I didn't quit on myself yesterday. See, if you quit on yourself today, you're not setting yourself up tomorrow. Because the stuff that you said no to or the stuff that you said, no, I can't do that today. I have Jesus, maybe not today. It's setting you back to getting to the place where you can say, no, Jesus, I understand that I have no time and the world is falling in on itself, but yeah, I'm still making time for you today. I know that it's hard. I know I don't have this. I know I don't have that. I know I need this. I know that things are, are not working out, but I'm still going to make time for you today. Discipline is just simply that. The ability to push through when things are difficult. But to be disciplined, you need to have things in place to be able to get there. And we're going to get there. The fourth D. So you must 
If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Following him. Following him is discipleship. It's discipleship 007. It's the seek it's the thing. Like you can't say I'm a disciple of Jesus but you don't follow him. You cannot follow anyone who's not in front of you. Does that make sense? You have there has to be someone in front of you for you to be able to say oh I'm following them. There can't be no one in front of you and now all of a sudden yeah I'm also a Christian or yes I'm also discipling or yes I if no one is following you you are not discipling if you want to know if you're discipling someone that's just the first litmus test that you must make is this person actually also you know adopting the things that we're talking about every time we meet are they coming alongside the same um, heart that is within Jesus do they understand what if that's not happening then you need to stop the train don't just go off by yourself stop the train and go okay what's going on because they're not if, if you if you're not in front and they they are in the back and you can see them you're not you're not being followed it's the same with the Lord Jesus is not the one who's I want to make a distinction here because you know he's a good shepherd but there's a different way in which people used to shepherd you know cowboys used to be on their horses and they'd be around the sheep right in the back of the sheep trying to get them into the gate jesus different jesus was like i'm gonna be in front you guys hear my voice i'm walking come jesus was like i'm on the seashore guys come jesus went this way those guys came which means they literally followed where he went. Now, for you and me to follow someone, it means we must fully be submitted to what they are saying. Fully. Follow me, Christ says. Cool. So what are, the, what are some of the other expectations? So we've looked at this now. Matthew 16, 24 very beautifully laid out there for us some of the other expectations we've talked about it being committed to jesus and then we're going to get to the great commission which is matthew 28 18 to 20 you all know it we spend time with it making disciples of the nations i'm going to just name a couple of things this is number three you must be humble in service number four follow the teachings of the sermon on the mount five do the will of god six love one another seven share with one another those are some of the just small things that, that, that we can put down on paper that are expected of you. Like when I look at your life, as you say you're a disciple of Christ, those things need to be evident. That number one, oh, you're committed to Jesus. There's an actual relationship with Christ. So I know, ah, man, this guy, this lady, they, they hear the Lord's voice. Why do they hear the Lord's voice? Again, you can't hear someone if you're not even in the house <laughs> you can't hear someone if you're not even in the same vicinity you can't hear someone if you don't even pick up the phone and say hello Jesus what I'm trying to illustrate is if you're not spending time with Jesus then you can fill in the blanks then I won't hear him does that make sense because a lot of people are happy to say they're Christians, but when you say to them, okay, are you spending time with the Lord? It's like, yeah, yeah, man, you know. No, 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 I don't know. And that goes back to desiring. So you, wanna, you have to want to make that time precious. Again, I'm preaching to myself more than I'm speaking to you. Because the Lord is working through man beautifully beautifully challenging me huh. so that needs to be evidence commitment to Jesus making disciples of all the nations my goodness this is this is one that I want to spend some time sort of eating up chewing up and and having us talk about as well this evening but that's something that we have to do I'm so eager for this time 
in the in 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 our season as, as a church you know the the experience that is coming up the outreaches and all the stuff I've, i'm so eager for it because i am convicted by my own absence of having walked roads with people and it should be the same for you because i tell you what when jesus made you the commission was the same for you as it was for this for the disciples it's no different no different and i want to say to you there's a very strict assignment to make christianity in our time to just be something that is about me and not about the people on the street who don't know Jesus the people who do know Jesus but are struggling and need to and need someone to walk a road with them so that they can hang on to Jesus and hold on to him this assignment is very clear you are being baited you know what it means to be baited right things are being dangled in front of your eyes all your life to engage with Jesus as less and as less as possible. And the reason for it means you are ineffective for what Christ wants you wants you to do. And what Christ wants you to do, it's not what us the church is not what Sfiso is saying up, 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 up front here for you to do. It's what Jesus is saying for all of us to do, and that is to make disciples of all nations. There needs to be evidence of that. Before you want to say to Jesus, Jesus, but I fulfilled my calling and my destiny of making it as a hotshot actor and people were, were blessed by my ministry as an actor. No. Jesus is going to be like, okay, I love your passion for your calling. Remember, I gave you the calling. But that calling was meant to also be evidence of people coming to me there's no reason there is no weight in your calling if it's not leading people to Jesus there's no separation between the two do you understand what I'm saying there is no weight in your calling if it's not leading people to Jesus humble in service number three oh you should want to you should want to serve people you should want to, I'm just, okay, um, I also should have prefaced, I'm not standing in front here trying to um, shout at you or scold you. I'm, I'm, I understand that in this room we are mature and we know that there is grace, right? There's grace for all of us when we don't manage to do these things or we do manage to do these things. There's grace. It is sufficient and it's amazing. But I wanted to make sure that I don't spend time patting you on the back about grace and making you comfortable about grace. We all know grace. Okay? We spend too much time on grace for that reason. And I want you to make sure that you understand what is expected of you. So that you, you don't go anywhere and say, but I didn't know. You, you should want to serve people humbly. You should want to follow, as I said, the teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. If you're watching things with women and all of that stuff and it's causing you to lust, hey, stop it. Okay, there's no, 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 there's no X, Y, it's not, again, it's not me that's saying it, it's the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Mount was given by Jesus, you got to say it louder, the Sermon on the Mount was given by Jesus, Jesus. he is the hope, he is the living hope, man, you got to say it loud and proud, some of us will say loud and proud other things, like, yes, go Ferrari, win, or yes, Lewis, win, win the race, no, 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 this race is about life. It's about life and it's about death. And the one who you need to be saying loudly and proudly is Jesus. And I want to follow Jesus. You, want to, you should want to do the will of God. I'm not talking about when it's challenging. I've already prefaced now about grace. Yes? Fair enough. You, you understand what I mean. But you should want to do the will of God. Which is why you must take up your cross daily. Because taking up your cross daily means, Father, I am struggling with this. I want to do the will of God. Help me here, Lord, right now. Focus me on your will. What is it? Help me find, I'm, I'm finding the cross. I want to find the reason for the eternal glory as well. Help me find it. Number six, you will need to love one another. This is in the, in the, in the context of church. In the context of your brothers and sisters. 
In this day and age, it is beautiful to look at Christians and see them loving one another in the church. It is difficult and sad to see others say they can make it on their own. They don't need the church. They are lone wolves. That is not the picture of, of discipleship. That is not the picture of disciples. The disciples followed Jesus wherever he was. They formed their own family. Even till when the church was first established in Acts, they formed their own family. They were together. No one was their own lone wolf. I'm not talking about separate commissions of people going to do things. But even then, you can see evidence. Paul bringing other people around him. So he made, he made sure that he was going and walking a road with other people. No one did anything by themselves. I want to say to you, if it is a difficult thing for you to commit to a church, you need to take it to the, to the king. Because God is very clear. Jesus is very clear. The church is his body. The church is not just Sfiso or Hercules or, or any... It's not... It's his body. You are a part of his body. Think about it this way. You cannot, as an organ of a body, survive outside the body. It's as simple as that. You cannot be a heart and think, okay, I'm going to be a heart by myself. You cannot. It's just physiologically impossible. The biology doesn't make sense. So you as a Christian, we must understand that your commitment to the body of Christ, if it makes it difficult for you because people are leading the body of Christ, then you must figure out, yourself. you must go to Christ and go, Lord, I'm having a difficult time submitting under people. Help my heart. Change my heart. Because again, those people were put in those places, over that church, over that place, that place by Jesus, by God. God said, all of, God said I'm, I'm placing the authorities over, over you. The people that are going to lead you, you must submit to them. Right? But for you to do that with grace, for you to do that with humility, it means you must love the brother and the sister. I've always had this idea in my mind to write a play about the body and to write the play about the parts of the body. There's a joke that you can find online as well about it. Beautiful, extended joke about the stomach and how every part of the body just shunned the stomach. And the stomach decides to shut down, decides to not work. And everyone else is now, the brain is like, guys, no, we need to just open up shop. Things are not working up because now the colon is clogging up now. Right? So the body is not functioning. But if they had just loved the stomach, if they had just loved the stomach, and they said, stomach, thank you for what you do. You are so important. Thank you, stomach, for what you do. We love you, stomach. Don't shut down again. They would never have been in that problem. Sometimes we lose out on amazing gifts that God has placed in our church because we don't love one another enough. We say no to people in our hearts and then they leave. And God is like, you missed it. Because that person was meant to be in this family so that you could see what I had planned for you. So yeah, I've got grace for you. Again, there's that grace word, but I'm not focused on grace here. I want you to hear the consequences of what it is that we are meant to be doing. How we are meant to live. We are to love one another. Because each and every person has a specific function and role that they bring to a body of Christ. I'm not saying to you that this must be your body of Christ. I'm saying to you, you must find one. If this isn't your church family, then you must go find. You must say, Lord, which one is it? And you must go plug in. Number seven, last one, you must share with one another. We must have the evidence of that as well. This world is, um, please excuse me. The world is very it is, uh, it's very clear to see how things are structured in the world. Everyone does things for themselves. We all do it for ourselves. We all make our own little islands. We have our own little nucleus family. We have our own little um, world that we revolve around and the things that happen within us. And it's difficult to sort of share. I was so blessed by the, word, the offering word today. 
because the idea that you and I only share from our abundance is not biblical. It is fine to share out of abundance. It is absolutely fine to share out of abundance. But it is not biblical because that means you only share when it suits you. Again, choice. Choice is not a thing in the kingdom of heaven. Choice is not a thing in the culture of discipleship. You don't have a choice. I want to say to you, you don't have a choice. <laughs> People are listening and like, no, I have a choice. You don't have a choice. If you had a choice, that means you are making your own religion. You are changing the things that Jesus expects of you. Does that make sense? <laughs> You and I don't have a choice when it comes to how we are to be disciples. Because Jesus lays it out. Cool. Let me move on. Discipline. I talked about discipline. But I'm going to jump to a passage of scripture that I want us to get into. And that's got to do with um, this Matthew 28 and this authority one. So just look at the end of uh, the chapter of Matthew there. Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20. I just want to read it just so that you can get the context of what I'm, I'm saying to you. So all the way through Matthew, all the way through this, particularly this book, this book. Now I'm not saying that the Gospels don't deal with what it means to be a disciple or, or, or what Jesus teaches uh, in terms of discipleship. They are very good. All of them are. The thing about Matthew is that it does a very good job of documenting the experience of the disciples. The experience of disciples through Matthew's lens, how things went down, the things that they learned, the things that they asked in arrogance or ignorance, all of those things are beautifully documented. And Jesus takes so much time in this particular gospel to unpack the uh, blueprint. That whole book, the, uh, the whole book of Matthew, the whole one, if you read it from first word to the last, you will, as I said before, you will trace every instance of discipleship teaching that comes from Jesus, what he expects of us. In Matthew 28 verse 18, it says, all authority, and Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now I'm not going to focus on the meat of this passage. What I want to focus on is the fact that there is someone who was given authority. Jesus said all authority was given to him in heaven and on earth. Right? And then he said, okay, go. Okay? So here again, there's that beautiful relationship between calling and commissioning. It's like, here's, 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 here's the thing. Go. And you've got to do these things. When he said go, he called them and he said, all of these things are the things that you must do. That was the commission. Baptize the nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, to make it clear, what I spent a lot of time doing today was making sure you understand that you are a disciple of Jesus. Correct? Yes? You are a disciple of Jesus because you are a follower of Christ. And because you are a follower of Christ, Matthew 28, 18 refers to you as well. No matter what age you are, whether you are three years old or whether you are a hundred years old, you are meant to be making disciples of all nations. He says all authority has been given to him on heaven and on earth. And he says for you to go and make disciples of all the nations. Do you know why it's important for you and I to take that to heart? It is because the nations are all represented in, in the, the space that you live in. You cannot have a, a place where you're looking at yourself as someone who is not worthy of taking space as a, as a disciple of Christ. Let me backtrack. Let me backtrack because I'm losing you here. So in Matthew 10, is it Matthew 10? Let me make sure I'm, I've got this right. Just hang on a second. When I talk about correlation, I 
it's not Matthew 10. And it's not Matthew 10. It's not Matthew 10. I'm going to look for it. And I, and I, and I'm, I'm, but you, you're going to have to take my word for it here. I apologize. In Matthew, there's a chapter in Matthew. I don't know which one it is. But the first few verses of that chapter, Jesus speaks to the, to the disciples and he addresses them. In two, two verses, he says to them, he addresses them as disciples. And very soon after, he addresses them as apostles. Very soon after. Now, I'm sorry I don't have the evidence here for you. But it, it, is, it is there. You will find it. And I want to bring to you something that is very important about when we get to Matthew 28. In Matthew... Now, the apostleship of the original disciples is a little bit different in terms of the office that they took up, right? They set up the first church. Hey, that's amazing. And we know that in many instances for us as followers of Christ, the office of apostle is a little bit different. You know, we, we almost remove ourselves from being apostles. We don't want to necessarily, that's not my space. I'm, I'm more of someone who's, uh, uh, I serve or I'm more of a teacher. I'm more of an evangelist. I'm more of a prophet. I'm more, of, you know, we, we, we look at the other gifts and we just want to make those things our things. And I'm not saying that the gift that you have that God has given you is not what you need to focus on. You should. But what I'm saying to you is that there is something that is beautiful in those two verses that happen where Jesus refers to them as disciples and then soon after refers to them as apostles. It is the, this correlation between making sure that they know who they follow and also the office of authority that they possess as he sends them out. The office and the authority that they have in the Spirit when He sends them out is akin to that anointing of the Apostle. And an Apostle is someone who is basically sent out. They are sent. So you need to understand your relationship as being one who has come into the fold of Jesus, the one who follows Jesus, and you need to see the correlation. It might not be that you are functioning fully in that office of an apostle, as in you are running the church and you have got these ministries going, but in a small micro, micro sense, you and I are disciple and apostle at the same time. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is a little bit, it might be a little bit wordy and a little bit strange here, but you and I, we occupy apostle and disciple at the same time because... I can only be the one who is in authority, in office. If I break down for you what an apostle um, basically does. Apostle, someone who is sent out and he spreads the gospel, right? With authority. Sent out, spreads the gospel with authority, teaches and is involved with some sort of, you know, administration aspect of, of the, the ministry and the word. And the, and, the, and the seeing of the kingdom of heaven on earth. So someone who spreads the gospel, someone who is called and sent out, someone who teaches, and someone who is involved in some kind of administrative, visionary um, scope of God's will being done on earth. You are an apostle to the people in your, in your world. Because you are the one that must spread the word, that must teach them, that must occupy some kind of administrative responsibility over them, which means you need to spend time about them over the vision that God has given you for them. You need to spend time creating your so-called quote-unquote little mini-ministry. You must be the head of that ministry because Christ has called you to it. Now, I'm not talking about a massive ministry. I'm, not, I'm really talking, if, if the words ministry are sort of, um, sort of stopping you or the word apostle is stopping you, I don't want you to think of it in those terms. I, but I do want you to think of it as Christ has called you to more than just being someone who follows him. Because following him is not just following him. Following him includes many other things. And that means the time that an apostle spends. Now, if we look at Paul, if we look at Peter, if we look at the, the, the original guys, right? They spent time praying for the churches that they went and ministered to. They spent time with those people. They healed the sick. They cast out demons. They did all of these things. They spent time doing it. Your calling 
and commissioning in Matthew 28 brought those two things together. Jesus said, I'm not giving you an excuse anymore. I am not giving you an excuse. This is not just about you following me so that you come into eternal glory. This is about also this other part of me. Because I, as, as I am Jesus, I am, I am one who follows someone, but I'm also one who's instituting, instigating, putting things in place. I'm also one who has vision. I'm also one who is being sent out by the Father. I was sent by the Father, Jesus said. And here Jesus has sent us as his ambassadors to do the same thing. So my sphere of influence is different from yours, which is why it's already been preached about in this church already, about this, this passage of scripture, where we're talking about, you know, all the nations and your nation is, you know, your influence is different to my influence. And if you want to look at it that way, there are many nations that you in, in, engage with that I will never engage with. And to make disciples of all the nations means that you have to engage deliberately. Hercules talked about it last week, intention. Intentionality. There has to be that intention. Vision, intention and means. So it costs. Right? So I want you to see that Jesus gives us authority. He, gives, he really has. He's given you authority in your life. Once you are a disciple, there is spiritual authority that rests on you as well because of the king who lives in you. And because of that spiritual authority that you have, there is a place in which God wants you and I to work from. Now, the most important thing about what is expected of us as any disciple is also going to be we can sum it up in the two great commandments right we can sum up what i'm talking about in the two great commandments to love the lord your god with all your heart with all your mind and with all your soul and to love thy neighbor as thyself we can sum that up that's what god wants from us to love thy neighbor means the neighbor is the brother next to you the sister next to you and it means the one who's not a follower of jesus like neighbor encompasses everything it means the enemy the person you hate neighbor encompasses it all Love thy neighbor as yourself. There's no distinction. Right? So love is an important part of what needed to be within the heart of a disciple as well. So we've talked about the list of stuff that you and I should, should exemplify and we should show in our lives. Now I'm talking about two sort of um, strangely abstract things. This place of authority that you and I possess and the love that, that needs to be in our hearts as well. You cannot do the things that someone asks you to do if you are not invested in it. And to be invested in anything means that you have an interest. And the more interest you show in something, the more you grow to love that thing. Right? Second portion of scripture that I want us to read today is from Matthew 8. Matthew 8. And I want you to see the relationship between love and authority that you both possess within the discipleship apostleship, apostleship space that lives within us because of Jesus. Matthew 8 verse 5 to 13. This is, this, this is the story of the centurion who comes to Jesus. I'm going to read from, from verse 5 right now as you're turning. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And, I, and he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such great faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And that very hour, his servant was healed. Servant was healed. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time focusing on this, the, 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 the trajectory and the strand of this passage of Scripture, because I know you've, we've all heard something from it. What I want to pull out for you is I want to pull out this idea of understanding 
of function. This man understands function, he understands office. Now, I've laid out to you your placing in, in office, right? You are a disciple who has authority in Christ because Christ lives in you. You need to understand your own authority. You must understand that it, it works. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. If you're not praying for the people that you're trusting God for, you can't see the evidence of things availing much. If you don't understand that your prayers avail much, you will not see the evidence of your prayers availing much because you won't do it. Now, the office here is very important. This man comes to Jesus. I'm not, call, I'm not calling him a disciple as such, but what I'm admiring here is his character. What I'm admiring here is his heart. What I'm admiring is his actual position, that he's a man of authority, a man who is respected. Now, a centurion had about a hundred soldiers that he was in charge of. So that meant that in those times, this was a person who was very... Take, you were taken seriously in the town or the village that you lived in. And you had lots of things at your disposal. And there was a lot of respect, honor that was given to you. And that meant that you had a lot of servants. Now for a man who understands his stat status in society to come. And the word does not shy away from what it's talking about. It says he came pleading, some translations say. Some translations say he came and he appealed to Jesus. Pleading. If you and I understand pleading correctly, we understand that there is no, there is no um, pride within the man's heart. He did not come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I am centurion so-and-so of this regiment and da-da-da-da of, Ro of the Roman Catholic Empire, or not, not Roman Catholic, I'm sorry, of the Roman Empire, and da-da-da, in the name of Caesar, you must heal my servant. He did not do that. Now that would be the way in which someone would conduct themselves in that office. Agreed? But no, scripture says he comes and he pleads for the man. Pleads for a servant. Now, we in this world that we live in, we don't understand uh, status anymore. If you're in India, it would be different because you'll understand class systems. You'll understand there's the very different, like, you know, putting you in place kind of stuff. We don't understand that anymore in the Western culture, and that's fine. That's why I want to take some time for you to understand that this man came and he was essentially pleading for someone beneath him. Pleading for someone beneath him. Not even just respectfully and in, in honor asking for, pleading for. You and I have an indictment against us. We sometimes treat other people, lost people, Unbelie uh, unbelievers, uh, believers who uh, have gone astray, we sometimes treat them with that kind of pompous pride. Jesus, please, you know, that person is going off the rails. Please heal them or please help them. And then that's, that's all the prayer that you do for them. And this man, who is not even counted as a disciple of Jesus, this man says, no, I understand what it means for, uh, um, uh, for me to come to this this king, this one true God who is Jesus. And I will plead for my servant. Now there are two things that I've already told you that, that show me what's going on in the scripture. And that is two things between the, the relationship between love and authority that are happening right here. The authority that the centurion has to ask Jesus how he asks him and the love that he has for his servant. Those two things are working beautifully in tandem right then and there. And you and I need to have that certain kind of heart when we come to Jesus. For the people who are lost. For the people that we love. For the people we are trusting God for. We need to come in love and we need to come with authority. Lord, I pray. And that authority means that you are constantly there. You are constantly asking the Lord. Matthew 7 says, ask and, you shall, uh, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. But if you don't ask, you won't receive. Right? So I hope you're pulling a few things there that are very, that are, that are very um, I think, in, important in our next phase that we're moving into. We need to have love, but we also need to move in authority. We need to move in authority. Because it's very easy to stay in the place where... You know, you know what's the problem with staying in the love 
love gospel? The love gospel gives you and I too many excuses to hide behind. The love gospel allows you and me to go, oh no, I'm just loving them. What does that even mean? How are you loving? Who? The definition of love is for you to have done something for that person. That's basic definition. And that's not my definition. That's whose definition? Jesus. The definition of Jesus' love is that he did something for you. You saying with empty words, oh, I'm not interfering with their life. I'm just loving them. You are not loving anyone. If you are not praying for them, if you are not fasting for them, if you are not spending time with them, if you are not walking a road with them, if you are not intentional about your interaction with them, you are not loving them. Stop using I'm just loving them as an excuse. That's the reason why I want you to see this very expressly here in this, in this passage of scripture. Love and authority go hand in hand. You need to understand that you have an authority in, the, in, in, in Christ and you must move in it. Last passage of scripture and then we are finished. Last one, John 21 verse 15. John 21 verse 15. This one is very, uh, very cool for me because it's, it's a beautiful moment between Peter and Jesus. Jesus has just appeared to them for the third time. This is after his death and his res- he was resurrected. He's appeared to them for the third time. And there's this moment, he's, the, the disciples, Peter said, at the beginning of the chapter, Peter's like, guys, I'm going fishing. <laughs> so they all go, he's like, okay, I'm coming with you. They all go, Jesus is on the shore. It's early, early, early morning, so there's not really clear light for them to know who's the figure on the, on the shore. But Jesus is like, hey guys, have you caught anything? And the terms that are used in those, in those days of asking if they've caught is basically, that's what people would use if they wanted to buy from the fishermen. So to the disciples, this is just a customer who's curious about food. It's not anyone serious. They keep going. The guy says, no, throw on the other side. They throw on the other side. John, who loves Jesus, as he's uh, told in, in, in scripture, the one who, who loved, the Lord loved him. We are constantly reminded. He, in, a, in, in his beauty, says, no, that's the Lord. Peter gets out of the boat, runs over to meet the, the, the risen king. And this is where we kind of pick up the, the, the story. So verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, they made some food. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now I stopped on love me more than these. Because I want you to see again, relationship between love. Love and authority. Call and commission. Do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Commission. Gave him authority. Commissioned him. Feed them. He said to him a second time, son, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Commission again. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time. I want to stop there. The beautiful thing about this third time is that Peter had been the one who had denied Jesus the third time, three times. And here God is, Jesus is saying, I'm going to help, let's rectify. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to heal that part of you. Do you love me? I'm going to ask you three times. And he was grieved. And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then he goes on, Jesus goes on to tell him how he's going to die one day. I'm going to read it. Read on. This is verse 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will be stretched 
um, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And verse, verse 19 says, This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Last one, follow me. This passage in John, the Gospels are a beautiful blueprint for what it means to be a disciple. This passage in John is almost exactly the same passage as in Matthew 16, 24 that we started with. Desire. Simon, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Okay, then you must deny yourself and you must follow me. He asks him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Desire. Okay, deny yourself. De desire. Deny yourself. And then he says to him, all right, this is your, your cross that you're going to have to bear. You are going to be killed in this manner. You are living this life for my glory and it's very good. But you must also understand that it's going to lead to your death. And Matthew 16 said, take up your cross. And Jesus finishes this passage of scripture and he says, follow me. God, in his manifold wisdom, laid out a foolproof plan for you and I to be able to know what is required of us to be disciples, firstly, who follow him, and those who are able to make disciples that will follow him. And none of that includes you and me being in the picture of the stars of the show in any way. None of that includes it. And what's lovely about this passage of scripture is that, again, Jesus is showing Simon Peter. He's saying to him, Simon Peter, there are many things that you're going to need to do. And all of this that I'm saying, feed my sheep, tend my, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, all of that has to do with, you're going to, you're going to have to disciple my people. Tend is another word for care. If you want to know what it means to be a disciple, you've got to care for the sheep that God wants. These lost sheep all over. You've got to care for them. You've got to want to spend time with them. You've got to want to feed them, nourish them, guide them. Caring means, caring means I'm not going to make you, I'm not going to allow you to veer off on the wrong path. I care enough for you. I care too much for you that I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going, to, I'm going to engage in your life. I want you to come this way. I want you to be led this way. Jesus is the one. So as we finish now, I want to ask you just a simple, simple question. That I'd, that I'd love for you to take time to unpack with the Lord when you are home tonight. God, show me which of these things I'm not involved with. Desire, denying myself, taking up my cross and following you. Show me which of them, which of them are not part of, of my heart yet. And deal with it one at a time. We're going to close now and I'm going to ask Nigel to play, the, play, play um, the next worship song for us. But after the worship song, I want us to please, I'm going to be here. Um, the leaders are here as well to pray with, with you. If you need prayer for any one of those, if you need prayer for just the expectation that awaits you as a disciple, if you didn't know it, and today was like, oh my goodness, this is too much. I didn't know that this is what it meant to say yes to Jesus. Get me out. <laughs> I want to say to you, don't jump ship yet. You'll be in trouble. To do.